It's fight drive. What's the definition of fight? This is why we use fight drive for patrol dogs. Drive to measure, measure physical prowess with rivals. So as the uh, adversary, or in this case bad guy, escalates his level of aggression, the dog escalates. As he de-escalates, the dog de-escalates. So you're using strictly reasonable force to effect an arrest. That's why fight drive is preferred for patrol dogs. If the guy stops, the dog stops. But when he runs away, that shouldn't be perceived as fight then. No, but there, what are you kicking in? Pray. 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 Stop right there, just get cold. He just kept rapping. He just kept rapping. The problem is if he was out of muzzle. <laughs> mm, and that happened. That happened. Uh, they had, uh, they, they tried to put this dog out. Like I said, it was the very start of our program. They tried to put him out and put him with a handler out of working cruises checkpoint. And the way they worked around this, and the, the, and the instructors, is a case of people not listening to the canine people. The, the canine trainers and instructors said, look, we don't want to put this dog out. The chief saying, yes, you will put the dog out. Okay, I'm ordering you. Cool. Put the dog out. And what they worked out is in going, I mean, the dog never aggressed coming uh, going to a search. So they take him out of the car and are coming back from a search. I'm sorry, I got backwards. The dog would never fire coming back from a search. But he would sometimes fire going to a search. So this handler keeps the dog in muzzle, takes him up to the front bumper of the car, pops the muzzle, runs the search, and then takes him back to the... And that's how this kid's having to work this dog. And this is before National Canine Facility was there, before canine experts were available in the service to address these problems. So, one night, fortunately, it was a winter evening. He's taking dog... He did that, did the thing, he's taking the dog back, and the dog fires out of muzzle, going back to the truck with a full mouth bite into the crotch. All right. Fortunately, he, it was a very cold night. Wind, snow, it was snowing, wind blowing, and the handler had on long johns and a lot of clothing. And of course, you know the other border patrol agents. This dog fires in this guy crotch. Everybody's breaking leather. And the guy's going, no, no, no. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he grabs his ball, thumps the dog on the side of the head with the ball, and says, Whew. "Dog, let go of the crotch." And sat, and gave him his ball, and put him in the truck, and then turned him in the next day. Um, they used to say this dog was ultimately put down. That's the only, the only thing we had. Third case. Third case. And this is very typical. This last case is very typical what you see, which isn't up on the slide, of what causes an idiopathic aggression dog sometimes to fire. We got a call from some department up in, I think it was Illinois, and they had this dog. Now, the story went that they had spent $14,000 for this dog from some dog vendor, okay? And the dog had bitten its handler one time and they couldn't find another handler to work the dog and gee, we're just stuck with this dog. Would you like him? Free. And this isn't uncommon. The, the dog biting a handler, as you can tell from my descriptions, it's kind of a common occurrence. We didn't think it was that big a deal. Okay, box him up, ship him to El Paso. He came in, he probably weighed around between 110 and 115 pounds. Uh, he looked like a coffee table with fur. Grossly overweight, so we couldn't work him. We put him in the kennel, put him on a reducing diet, and he'd been in the kennel. We were right in the middle of a class. He'd been in the kennel for some months, about a, about one, uh, about a month and a half while we were finishing up the existing class. In that meantime, we'd gotten two packets from this police department. The first packet was a newspaper, newspaper article about how wonderful this dog was. Cool. But a week later, another packet comes, and it's dog shot records, or medical records. And when we're in the middle of a class, we were just swamped. I mean, uh, Clark Larson, who you saw there on the tape, uh, was in the middle of his class. He got the packet, opened it up. Oh, it's Rico's shot records. Threw them on his desk. Well, it got to the end of class. It was the last day. And uh, an instructor student had just graduated named Eric Odden was assigned to basically take care of the dog. Eric goes out last day, leashes the dog up, puts a muzzle on him per procedure, takes him outside, starts grooming. The dog is just a lover. He's loving, oh, I'm so nice to be able to kill him. And Eric proceeds to groom him for about 20 minutes. Uh, finishes the grooming session, pops the muzzle off, and starts back to the kennel, and Clark walks up. Dog pulls free of Clark, runs over, or pulls free of Eric and runs at Clark, and Clark said the dog had target lock when he was coming at me. He could see that hard, cold stare that we described in fight drive. But he kept his cool and said, hey, Rico, 
kicked into permissive tone, the dog snapped to a heel at his side. And, oh, you're a nice dog, and they start, and they miss some stuff on his side. Eric missed some stuff, and Clark got the brush. Eric's holding the dog, and they start brushing. And the, they continue to brush the dog for about another five, ten minutes. Clark stops and stands up and cocks his right arm to clean out a brush. And pow, dog hit his arm. Okay? With an immediate death shake. That first hit, the upper, upper left canine, bored down, hit bone, and then Clark jerked back. The dog was in a fight bite. Clark jerked back and then went forward, but that jerk back sliced to tip of elbow, clear to the bone. Okay? Eric Odden, fortunately, was an extremely experienced instructor. Pow, pow, he grabs the dog's collar, five and seven, snaps him into a choke. And that, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a dog that bites somebody, that's what you go for. You go for the collar and choke. Do not, because you will rip muscle out. You go five, five o'clock and seven o'clock on a collar and snap up. And that will cause a gag reflex and get the dog to open his mouth first so you can roll, a, roll out of the bite. If you don't have a collar, <laughs> go, for th go for trachea. Go for trachea. If you animal control people, dog comes in, hits you, grab collar, control the head, and choke. That's all you can do. If he has a leash on, dog coming at you has a leash on, out of muzzle, he's coming at you and he means business. If you can get your hands on that leash before he gets his teeth into you, get him airborne. <laughs> Huh? You keep him airborne until he goes unconscious. Because it's either that or an emergency room trip, folks. I've got a real aversion to emergency rooms. <laughs> I don't like punctures. I'm not a real fan of that. And this is an extremely severe situation where this dog, you've got a choice. You either take this dog out or you're going to an ER. So you've got to get him airborne. Yes, ma'am? Mm -hmm. Then what do you do? I would keep choking until you can get him to go semi-unconscious or unconscious. That's all you can do. Now remember what I did with the dog that hit me. I grabbed head and then I put him into something we're going to talk about after lunch, which is basically an alpha roll, but I pinned him to the ground. With the dog of the size that I was going up against, if he gets four feet on the ground and gets control, he'll start the death shakes. And that's where you're going to get the damage. So I had to control the head, keep him airborne until I could flip him on his back. And then I had all of my body weight on top of him. And we're talking a 95-pound dog that has been trained to take people out <laughs> and has that experience. Uh, hopefully, most of you, none of you will ever have to go up against that. But, uh, but your adrenaline fires in. Yeah, old man does it. <laughs> anyway, dog hits here, like I said, it ripped, tip of elbow all the way around. Eric Odden gets in with a five and seven choke, snatches the dog up, dog spits out. Clark's arm kind of went limp and he got a secondary snap on his arm. Gets him up, leash, he had a leash on him, and as many as he let him go, he said, follow, which is a European command for heel, and the dog. Totally fine, until he got to the gate. Now, by now, Clark is spewing because he cut a main artery, and he's going for pressure, and he's going down. And, he, and so Eric has to get the dog secured and get back to Clark. So there was a, the compound fence is right around the corner. Eric heals the dog, and the dog just prances as fine as can be. And Eric came in to flip the gate latch, and the dog came up, pow, hit that hand. Okay, Eric pushed into the gate, spun around, grabbed the dog by the throat. Well, actually what Eric did is drilled him three times in the throat and then kicked him in the stomach as hard as he could and that popped the bite. Eric threw him back, got the gate closed. So he came out with a bite and Clark is now bleeding out. And uh, to say it, it was cut all the way down to the joint from tip of elbow all the way around and Clark's arms about like that. It was a deep, deep gashing wound. Transforming in the hospital, they packed it and everything worked out. But how close it came was the main nerve that controls the hand runs right through there. The sheath on that nerve was cut, but the nerve was intact. Basically, the nerve was dental floss for the dog's teeth. And Clark still works with us today. He's, a, he's one of my top instructors. But that's idiopathic. What happened? Grooming, petting, and then stopping. Very typical of idiopathic. You pet. You're petting the dog, oh, what a lovely dog, and the dog says, ah, and you stop, and the dog goes, Bing! Very typical, typical of idiopathic behavior. Okay, uh, any questions? Question. Yes. If a dog gives warning, do I understand that that rules out idiopathic? Pretty much. 
that I, that I have experienced, and I've talked to several people who have had idiopathic, typically it is no warning, no body language warning at all. Somebody over here? Okay, uh, repeating a question. If the dog warns, gives a growl prior to, the prior to the bite, does that rule out idiopathic? Pretty much, but I'm very hesitant in this case because so much is not known about it to say never. Now, I have heard of idiopathic situations where the dog was growling as he was coming. So you could rule that a warrant also, but he's coming at you. The most important thing is they do not stop. Typically, like a rank drive bite will be a bite, and the person backs off, and the dog will let him go, and I showed you. These suckers keep coming, and then all of a sudden, they'll just stop, and they're fine. Maybe a little dazzled, because it's seizure-related. They may be a little disoriented, but they'll stop just suddenly. They'll hit suddenly and stop suddenly. Idiopathic aggression is extremely rare. I've, I know in my entire history, I've been in police canine for about six, 15, 16 years now, to add it up. Uh, and in those, and in the capacity for about 12 of those years, I was in a training mode where I'm cranking dog after dog after dog through, a, through training programs. I've only seen three of them. And that's uh, over a history of probably close to 400 dogs. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, one, before we break, um, the lunch was provided by two of our members, Charlotte Mollenbeck, who's over here, and Sherry Thomas. So thank you. We ready for lights, camera, and action? Cool. All right. Uh, a lot of people came up with a lot of different problems uh, during the break. Uh, I will try and address those. I can't remember them all. So as, I'll give you all an opportunity in a question and answer period to bring up those cases to me again so everybody can get the benefit of the, of the advice. Uh, now we're going to start talking about trying to correct some of this behavior. We've identified that it's psychological drive related. We've eliminated hormonal imbalance or illness and hopefully idiopathic aggression has been eliminated. And now we're going to try and address a specific problem. Now I will not have the time today to go over all the different problems and what you can do. Uh, it's just two myriad, a uh, number of them I'm going to hit two of the most prevalent problems, namely handler aggression and dog aggression. Uh, and I will try and address some of your uh, different problems as best I can with the time I have. Uh, which, by the way, I'm, I'm not locked in here. We can go in as long as you all want to. Uh, you're going to have to get some equipment to effectively address and work with an aggressive dog. The first piece of equipment you want to buy if you're going to be dealing with an aggressive dog is a muzzle. Uh, you absolutely cannot deal with an aggressive dog unless you have a muzzle. Uh, now the advantages to muzzle are a myriad. Number one, you have effectively disarmed the dog when you muzzle him. He cannot bite you. Uh, this enables you to, uh, to effect corrections in a timely manner for specific behavior uh, aggressive behavior, you can immediately address it and effect effective corrections without risk to injury. The second thing that a muzzle does is it makes everybody around the dog relax. Okay? Uh, you obedience trainers, you're trying to work with an aggressive dog and so you're working, maybe he's, uh, he's aggressive towards people coming up to him <coughs> or something like that and so you're trying to work with it out of muzzle and the handler is sitting there, oh, Jesus Christ, please don't bite the trainer. And that tight leash is going right into the dog's neck, and the dog goes, well, Dad's scared of this guy for some reason, so I'm going to take him. <laughs> okay. I mean, they pick up on those kind of body language cues real quick. You put a muzzle on the dog, everybody kind of goes, Whoo! because the most you're going to get is a, is a busted nose or something, a max worst type thing. He'll fire and punch you, but that's going to be about it. Um, for a muzzle to work effectively, for a muzzle to work effectively and address a problem, the dog must forget that the muzzle is on. Okay? Now, this comes from German police dog training. We use these muzzles uh, to train patrol dogs to apprehend felons in all situations. And the reason we use the muzzle is myriad. Number one, we can recreate anything that would happen on the street. We, we can recreate with the dog and muzzle and experience. If we want to have a dog 
search a crawl space, find a guy, fight a man in a crawl space, we can do that safely with a dog and muzzle. So people are agitating dogs, agitators can act like bad guys, backup officers can act like backup officers, and they don't have to worry about getting bitten. The second thing is we are trying to enhance fight, right? What was the body, body behavior of fight? Driving in and wrapping. Hard to pull down and away with one of these on, you fall off. They have to drive in and wrap, so it enhances fight. But more importantly, for this to work in patrol dog training, the dog, again, has to forget that the muzzle is on. If we put it on, have him go out and do muzzle fights and all that, and take it off, this, you get what is re referred to as boxing glove syndrome. This means, oh, we're doing bite work. This means, oh, we ain't doing nothing. All right? So the same thing, same rules apply when using a muzzle with an aggressive dog. This means I'm about to get my butt kicked. This means I can get away with bloody murder. All right? So we have to get the dog where he forgets the muzzle is on. We do that through long-term wear. All right? You folks that wear, wear glasses, when you put your glasses on in the morning, you remember them. You know, oh, I got my glasses on. After about 30 minutes, you forget they're there. Okay? So if you're going to use a muzzle on an aggressive dog, that's the effect you have to have. That muzzle goes on, and you take the dog for a walk. That, muz <coughs> that muzzle goes on, and you play fetch and let him bap a ball around. But the muzzle does not just go on right at the instant you want to affect a correction. It's long-term wear, and you hopefully set the dog up. Okay, I know this dog's going to fire in this situation. So an hour before you're going to recreate it, you put the muzzle on, let him go for a walk, so on and so forth, and then present him with that situation he fires. He's forgotten the muzzle is on, and you can affect a correction safely. So we have to have muzzles that can withstand, and the dog can wear long-term uh, comfortably without getting overheated and they can drink water through, they can breathe normally through them, and most importantly, they have to be secure. You don't want these boys to come off at the right time. <laughs> it gets real ugly. So, I'm going to go over some different types of muzzles available on the market. I'm going to start with the standard plastic, or for that matter, leather one-piece muzzle, with a single neck strap. All right. Now by single neck strap I mean you have one buckle controlling either side and it's just like a collar. These muzzles ladies and gentlemen have two settings. Choke the dog and come off. There's no middle ground. These are great for giving an aggressive dog a bath or something like that but that's about it. If you're going to work with an aggressive dog you do not want a muzzle that has a single neck strap. All right, now I'll show you the difference. A double neck strap. This is a German basket muzzle. It was designed for training patrol dogs. It was designed for this work. It is the best muzzle made in the world. Uh, when you take this muzzle apart and unbuckle it, you'll see something very clear. Let me get the buckle off. Okay. As I hand this around or, or show it to you, you see we have this strap coming over the top. All right, we have this strap coming over the top that goes to the buckle. We also have another strap coming around the bottom that goes to the same buckle. That is a double neck strap. We also have a nose strap that comes up the, up the bridge. This muzzle you can put on a dog, size it exactly and that, this muzzle will not come off if you do it correctly. It will not come off. And the dog can wear it for long-term wear. Very good muzzle. Yes, ma'am. That looks like a, a muzzle for a dog like a German Shepherd with a long snout. Yes, ma'am. What about the animals with a shorter snout? Or a, a Those are tough. Uh, sometimes you can get the, sm the smaller sizes, and you, most of you are not going to buy this muzzle. Bargain price, 200 250 bucks per head. But, for you folks that deal with aggressive dogs, exactly, <laughs> one bite in a hospital emergency room, okay, but for you guys that work with aggressive dogs pretty regularly, I'm talking like animal control people, people, veterinarians, I'd invest the money, folks, because <laughs> you're dealing with it all the time. Uh, there's a couple of different, mostly police 
canine supply catalogs like Ray Allen, Q Systems, uh, and I, they're very, they're imported from Germany, they are expensive, but they're well worth it, because if you take care of them, they'll last forever with proper care. They're a very good muzzle. Uh, now I'll give you a middle ground option. We didn't like paying $200 for a muzzle either. <laughs> um, for, my, for, the, for the handlers that I deal with, occasionally we ha we'll have an aggressive incident, it isn't something that's ongoing long term. Uh, we standardly issue this muzzle. This is a leather one piece muzzle. It has by spec and at our request has the same double neck strap system. It has a strap going underneath and a separate strap over the top to mimic the German model. Uh, it's put out and I, I don't get any kickbacks. <laughs> it just happens to be the only people I know that are making a decent one piece muzzle. Uh, it's put out by a company named Trainer's Choice in Ohio. For those of you that are interested, I have the address up in the front after the lecture, I'll give it to you. Uh, it's made by the Amish, 35 bucks. Not bad. It's muzzle for 35 bucks. Uh, now, at any rate, let's talk about putting this muzzle on. They just stuff their head down in a bucket and drink out of the bottom of the muzzle. Same with this one. They learn to drink, out of the, drink through a muzzle. It's no big deal. This muzzle will be a little bit hotter. It's heavier, and it doesn't have as much ventilation as this one. So you can't do as much long-term wear with this as you can with this. But I'll use the German muzzle as an example. Now to size the muzzle and get it on, first thing you do is you kind of approximate on the bottom strap. Now, and uh, the veterinarian said, well, you've got to get the owner to get the muzzle on. Well, that's really not that big a deal. Yes, it's a big deal if the owner does this. It's going to be a big deal. <laughs> They'll play dodge muzzle for four hours trying to get this muzzle on. But what you do is you cock and lock the muzzle. And here's how you cock and lock a muzzle. You put it on the first, buck, the first notch on the buckle, like that, and you leave that tab sticking out. That's how you hand a muzzle to somebody. Put your dog in muzzle. This is how you do it. So they grab collar. Come here, Fluffy. Boom, boom. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let go. <laughs> I got you. And then you buckle that thing down, and you've got him. OK? If you've got a dog that's being a particular pain, in the you can do the same thing. If this muzzle was, was old and had oil on it, like it's supposed to have, you basically curl this muzzle around, fold it out where you've got a little bowl. Fill that bowl up with hot dogs. <laughs> Want some hot dogs? Mm -hmm. Dogs say, oh, cool, a food bowl. Of course, you'll jam hot dogs up his nose, but you got it. <laughs> <laughs> you have him now. You're mine now. <laughs> but that's how you put a muzzle on. Now, after you get it on, there's certain sizing you want to do. Uh, now, it seems just the opposite. And this is with a double neck strap muzzle. If you got it in there and his nose is jammed right up against that front of the muzzle, and it's really obviously uncomfortable, then what you have to do, if the nose is tight against the muzzle, you tighten the bottom strap. Just the opposite of what you think. If the nose is tight, you tighten the bottom strap. If he's backed off, okay, where his nose is way back here and he may come out the top, you loosen the bottom strap. And it doesn't make any sense, but what it is is the dog's neck is basically conical in shape. It's wide down around the shoulders and it goes in a cone shape up to the base of the skull. By changing this bottom strap, that sets where on the neck the muzzle will cinch. So if the muzzle is tight against the nose and you tighten the bottom strap, what you're basically doing is making the muzzle cinch further up the neck and it backs him off. And if it's, the, conversely, if it's loose, he's out here, and you loosen the, the bottom strap, it makes it set lower on the neck, and you put the dog's nose deeper in the muzzle. That's how that works. But you can size that muzzle exactly, and he can wear it long term with no problem. So after you've got that adjustment down, the first thing you want to do is reach down here, and in both cases, you want to have this strap coming up the front. Don't get one that doesn't have this strap because that helps keep the dog's nose, the top of the dog's muzzle, in, in the muzzle. You want to grab this and pull directly forward. And pull good. 
If he goes, well, you ain't, ain't got your muzzle tight enough. <laughs> and we're back to, okay, come here. <laughs> okay. Now, particularly with the German muzzles, not so much with the trainer's choice, but with the German muzzle, we also have these ventilation holes down in the bottom. So you also want to grab the front of the muzzle, and you do it with the trainer's choice too, just to make sure he's not going to drop out the front. And you pull straight up, just like that, and see if he drops out. You also want to see if his lower jaw looks like he's going to come through this hole or this hole in the bottom, these two holes. That's easily fixed by taking a piece of leather boot lace and wrapping it around that nail and weaving it back and forth and it closes that hole up so his jaw won't drop out. And there you go, your dog's in muzzle. That's how you size a dog for a muzzle and put him on, put a muzzle on him. But again, he has to have it on long term. He forgets it's on, then he screws up, then he gets corrected, and then you don't take the muzzle off right away there then either. You just let him wear it a little bit longer and take it off. And you put him in muzzle for benign things. Things like going for a walk or running around a backyard, as long as you're right there with him. And let him wear it long term. I've had, dog, I've had a dog in muzzle upwards of three days. Just because he was a real pain. And we couldn't trust him. I, I had him in muzzle upwards of three days. Now, you can actually feed him through it. You can pull this side, side out of the muzzle and stuff food down there and, and you know, <laughs> and you can feed him out of it. And that's how I've had a dog in muzzle upwards of three days. Without any problem, the dog not suffer any major discomfort. Okay. Now, the next thing to come out and that you may want to invest in is what is called a head collar or halty. Cornell University is using them quite a bit. And this little device here, as you can see, it looks like a muzzle. But what it is actually is, is you're moving the leverage. Typically, your choke chains and collars are back here. You're now moving the live ring out directly underneath the dog's chin. And it works like a halter on a horse. And it gives a tremendous amount of leverage to the dog, or to the handler against the dog. Uh, these things work extremely well. Uh, you know, the obedience trainers in the room, you all remember the, this girl, right? She shows up just about every class. Everybody's got one. Uh, typical yuppie housewife. She shows up in red high heels, uh, a skirt down to about here, about maybe weighs soaking wet, 110 pounds. Uh, she has her Hearts Mountain Special uh, loop of leather with the chain leash. Everybody's got one of those in their class first day, right? <laughs> And, and then this goes to another Hearts Mountain Special bear chain that's about five sizes too big. And it's attached to about a 95-pound giant schnauzer that's dog aggressive. And here she comes. And he, boom, <laughs> right? Vaults into your class and mauls five chihuahuas, you know. <clears throat> For these people, <coughs> this works extremely well. For people that are, are physically, the dogs are overpowering them physically, this gives them a little bit of a leverage because a small person can turn a large dog with this thing. It's how they turn horses on a halter. It works extremely well. Uh, it uh, <clears throat> is extremely effective for moderate aggression. We'll refer to it in some of the problem solving. Uh, but it, because by pulling on the live ring, you effectively muzzle the dog to a certain degree. But it is not meant as a total replacement of a muzzle if the dog is truly aggressive, because the dog can still bite you. So it's not, but it can be used in conjunction with a muzzle, if you wish. In my classes, teaching a handler to use the policy in class is almost impossible because it takes a while for the dog to become accustomed to it. Just like a muzzle. Got a for that. What we generally do, uh, and the same with muzzles, is we engage a drive. Uh, I.e., if the dog likes to likes to chase a ball, got to pray. Okay. Well, we'll he's getting it on, he's screwing with it, and we'll get him. Hey, want a toy? And that gets him to forget it. Oh wow, a toy! Just engage a drive. Uh, that works. Getting them moving, correcting them for any pawing stuff like that. You can usually get them going without too much trouble. But you're right, it takes a little bit of time for them to adjust to the same with a muzzle. Yeah. I use whole people all the time in those situations. And I tell people to take five lessons 
Yeah, if they've been uh, if they've been typically giving standard lease corrections, you know, well, you don't want to do that with these. <laughs> you know, you got to twist his head off, and <laughs> it's a nice, easy drag correction. It's just the opposite of what you do with a chain collar. But they're very, very effective. But they cannot, they are not a replacement for a muzzle, but they can be used in conjunction with a muzzle in working with an aggressive dog problem. They're very economical. One thing about sizing them is when you get this, this neck strap should be very snug or the dog will pull out of it. I mean, you've got to get it pretty snug right behind the, right behind the ears or the, it'll come out over the head. But you've got to make sure you've got it sized right and cinched up good and tight. One uh, caution, if you're working with an aggressive dog, I mentioned sizing muzzles and the sizing of the halties. As instructors, you have a handler go out, put a muzzle or a halty on his dog you know, at a given exercise, you always check that muzzle before you do anything. Always. Because the, the owner will go, oh, well, he's getting a little hot, and back that thing off about three notches. The next thing you know, you're in there trying to do something, and the muzzle goes <laughs> Okay, yeah, before you start any exercise, either in muzzle or with a halty, you always give a little check of that muzzle, either by pulling on the muzzle or making sure that the neck strap is good and tight on the halty so it does not come off. It's just a matter of procedure, just like you may check to make sure they got their chain collar on right. And the same thing with muzzles and halties. You make sure they've got them on right before you start any exercise. Okay, the next, um, yeah. Halties, yes. Muzzles, depends how severe the aggression is. I'll give you an example. We have to get our dogs used to being picked up and put up in the back of semis. And typically in every class we have about two or three of them that you pick them up and they freak. You know, in that case, yeah, we muzzle them, and we don't correct. We get up there and they go into spastic, and then we just wait for them to calm down, get tired, and then we go, no, oh, no, don't you stupid, put it back. <laughs> you want to do it again? See, and keep doing that, and after a while they let you pick them up and put them down. So in that situation where there's a situation where the handler may get bit, as a, in the process, yes, I would muzzle, and then of course acclimating the dog to the muzzle first. Okay, the other piece of equipment you will need or tell the owner to obtain is a wire plastic dog crate, uh, standard piece of equipment. Uh, if you're working on trying to socialize the dog in crowds, uh, maybe the dog's fearful of show environments, things like that, uh, or shows aggression and things like that, you can, there you can can the dog up and put him in the environment and he feels safe and secure in his little den and people can come up and work around the dog and stuff like that safely. That a muzzle. So that's a good piece of equipment to have. Okay. Now we're going, any, any questions on equipment before I move on? Okay. Now we're going to get into uh, a exercise. It's developed by the German police. called Hunde Auslaufen. Hunde Auslaufen, that translates into dogs out running. Basic premise is let dogs be dogs. Uh, the purposes for it, it relieves mental stress, acclimates the dog to muzzle, socializes the dog with people, combats dog fighting, and helps with courage and confidence problems. Now, I take, basically tell you what Hundauslaufen is so you understand. What we will do with a Hundauslaufen exercise is we will take two or three dogs in muzzle properly fitted and take them for a walk initially, uh, do all the smelling of the rears and all that stuff when we've got a leash on them. And then after uh, they seem to, everything seems to be going all right, we'll turn them loose Boom. in a secure area. I let them run and play. Now, by muzzling, you've effectively disarmed the dogs, so they're not going to hurt each other. They'll spit and froth and punch each other, but they're not going to hurt each other. Uh, and you can affect correction. So you can go out there and get the dog around other handlers and people. He's muzzled. Everybody come up and pet the dog. If you're working on a dog that is aggressive towards people, you muzzle him and do a hundauslaufen with a group of about three or four strangers. 
by petting him and talking to him. And if he fires you, institute corrections that we'll talk about in a little bit. A little bit. Uh, let me explain uh, the point five. Helps with courage and confidence problems. If you go back to your first handout down there under character traits, you, <coughs> you will find uh, two definitions. You'll find courage and confidence. Okay? Now, courage is an absence of fear towards objects or in situations. Confidence is environmentally conditioned acceptance of safety. Now, any time you have a fear response from a dog to an environmental situation such as slick floor, a, a slick highly polished floor, or going in a building, or what have you, any time you have a fear response, you are dealing with one of two things, either a lack of courage, which is genetically based, or a lack of confidence, which is based on environmental conditioning. Okay? So, if we bring a dog, for example, we're trying to get a dog ready to go into a show ring or something like that, and we bring him in to a slick, highly polished floor, and he locks up. All right? Well, that could be courage or confidence. Now, how do we figure out which one uh, it is? Well, we try and correct the problem. We try doing ball tosses onto the, onto the floor if he's got some prey drive. And one of the exercises we can do is Hunda Auslaufen with a dog that is confident on slick floors. All right, we take a dog that is totally fine on slick floors, we muzzle him up, muzzle our problem dog up, we go for a walk out there in the grass, and then all of a sudden, bingo, we're coming inside the building. Because what we're trying to do is show this dog that it's safe. What better way to do it than with another dog? The other dog says, what's your problem? I'm out here. I ain't got a problem. And then if it's confidence, the dog will go ahead and go in. And what you're dealing with is a dog that had never seen a slick floor in his life. Been on dirt kennel all his life, what have you. He's never seen it before. He's naturally afraid of it. Ergo, I ain't going in there. But once he sees his buddy go in there, okay, cool. But if he doesn't get any better, you're looking at a genetically based lack of courage for unsure footing. And don't matter what you're going to do, you probably never get the dog on he, or if he does come on, he'll come on, the nails will be up and looking like Bambi on the ice. That's courage. That's lack of courage, and you reach a certain point, you know you're not going to fix it. So that's what's referred to about the courage, dealing with the courage and conf uh, confidence problems with Hunda Auslaufen, using another dog to show the problem dog that the area is safe. Okay. Now, let's... Uh, Go on a little bit, and we will talk about what we do. We mentioned it. If these dogs decide to either get in a fight or fire on one of the handlers, get in there and muzzle, so nobody's really going to get hurt. What basically happens there is the handler or handlers of the offending dogs wait in there as quickly as possible. If it's a dog to dog fight, you sure don't want it to go on long. Okay? They wait in there as fast as possible, physically separate the dogs, break eye contact, and put them in obedience downs. Down. Okay? Talking in low growling voice tone, down. Now what, what's happening there is each handler is coming in and saying, I'm the leader of this pack, and I'll tell you who to fight. And instituting separation and downing them. Okay? In severe cases, then where, I mean, they're still firing or maybe in the process of separating them, they fire at the handler. That is not frustration, ladies and gentlemen. That's rank. And that we correct. And I think that was the confusion that was created in our discussion of frustration versus rank earlier. Two dogs fighting, separating two dogs fighting, and they bite the handler is not frustration. They get in there rocking and rolling, and anything moving is a target. Anything. They don't know what they're biting half the time. They think it's the other dog and pow. It isn't frustration. They are actively engaged in rank. And you just got in the way as far as they're concerned. And sometimes in separating dogs, you will see them turn, growl, eye contact, even fire in trying to separate the dogs. Then we correct that. And the term used for this is a, quote, alpha roll. Now, I will emphasize this exercise is a major correction on a dog. Not physically, but mentally. It is confined to
to two situations only. You only underline 300 times bold letters in your notes two situations you use now for a while. One is severe dogfighting or severe people aggression. That's it. Now, some of you may have already gotten the AKC Gazette. Article in here I just read it last night by Margaret Gibbs called Wolfman Corrections where she condemns alpha roles. I agree with her because the example she used in that, in that article were do being done on puppies for non-rank issues. They were play biting and people were alpha rolling them for it. That is incorrect. That should not be done. I totally agree with what she's saying here based on her experience with alpha roll because her experience is confined to these situations where these puppies were doing very minor type of aggressive play fighting, things like that, and we're going and grabbing their throats and doing all this other stuff. Of course, it's the improper use of an alpha roll. The only time you use it is severe dog fighting and severe people aggression. That's the only, only time you use an alpha roll. And number two, the other problem with this, this article, what the monks of New Skeet didn't tell us, you only do it in muzzle. <laughs> they didn't put that in the book, but you only do this in muzzle. And here, both these dogs were out of muzzle. And the owners come, ah, that bite's all over me. Well, of course, you're doing it out of muzzle. You only do it in muzzle. Only. Okay? I only know of, now, there are situations where handlers that I know of, one of them, know a couple of them, where they have very rank patrol dogs. And they've gotten to a point of diminishing that rank down where they can roll the dog, roll the dog out of muzzle, and they have to worry about it. But that's very rare. You only do an alpha roll in muzzle, period. And you're going to see why in just a minute. What is done with an alpha roll? The dog shows aggression in muzzle. In muzzle, please remember, in muzzle. If he shows aggression out of muzzle, you just go, cool, I'll get you tomorrow. <laughs> Go put him in a muzzle, take him for a walk, come back, recreate the situation, and then he acts up, and now I got you. And remember that next time where you don't get in that situation until you always set that dog up regularly. Where he's in muzzle, he's in that situation, and he acts a fool and he gets nailed for it. So, dog shows aggression. You get the dog onto his back. Now, you have to be extremely careful doing this. Do not come up and go, Wah! and jump on the dog because you can blow a shoulder, you can injure a dog very easily. So the way you get a large dog, I'm talking mostly a large breed, you know, the small dogs, <laughs> like alpha rolling a gerbil, you know. <laughs> but, but the big dogs are the ones that are tough. If you've ever seen uh, calf ropers put, put a calf down, okay, they grab skin at about the neck and the flank and they pick the dog straight up, put their knee into their side, and flip the legs out, and then boom, put them down. They get them flipped. You want to get the legs out from under the body so you do not injure legs, spine, things like that. Boom. And you'll see me do an alpha roll here in a minute. And the dog came up here, and I went for a rear foot and rolled him this way. Uh, once you get the dog on his back, you assume a four-point stance over the dog and apply light emphasize, underline, bold letters, light pressure to the dog's throat. If you go full pressure, the dog may break survival. I'm about to die and kick. So light pressure to the dog's throat. Direct eye contact, low growling tones. Okay? And you keep that up. Direct eye contact, low growling tones, whatever oaths you want to throw in there for spice, until you see, and the dog will be pushing up against you, and you will, after a period of time, see the dog break and the feet come down. All right, as he de-escalates, you de-escalate. Very important, as he de-escalates, you de-escalate, but you don't get right off of him. He de-escalates, you'll see his, his eyes break, he'll break eye contact, you de-escalate. Maybe take your hand off the throat, but you're still on top of him. You're playing the part of an alpha animal. You stay right on top of him, he will go into a fetal. Eyes broke, then you slowly dismount. Very slowly, you get off, get off of him, but you keep your face right over his. And you pivot right on your head, right around him, and then you walk away. And then he's up, all sins are forgiven, and we go off, and that's it. 
Most alpha rolls will not last more than about 30 seconds. Most. You're going to see one that lasts upwards of five minutes. This was a rank boy. Five minutes. Clocked. This was a rank dog. Extremely handler aggressive. Okay. Again, only used severe dog fighting, severe people aggression. Only time you use an alpha roll. Period. And you only do it in muzzle. Period. With a muzzle that's checked. Period. And size crop properly. That's the only time you use this. Because you can mess a dog up with this. I <laughs> mean, you know, dog doesn't sit, sit square. <laughs> only for those situations. And you will effectively diminish the aggression that you're trying to address. You will effectively diminish it. If it's severe dog fighting, you will address that. And we'll, talk, we'll get into dog fighting in more detail in just a little bit. Uh, there, you'll d diminish it so long as a certain drive isn't at a certain level, then nothing works. But you can effectively diminish dog fighting to a certain degree, to a major extent. You can diminish handler aggression to a major d extent. Yes, ma'am. It will have to be the handler. It will have to be the handler. Now, obedience guys, you guys are probably, let's face it, happens to me every day. You got a ranked dog, and you've got him muzzled up, and you try and tell them, okay, I want you to do this, this, and this. They never do it right. First time, they're shocked. They, may, they probably think you're flipping nuts. <laughs> you know? Dog shows rank, it's usually the obedience trainer or the canine instructor or whatever. This dog's ranking on a handler. Come here. <laughs> and makes his point. But for it to be effective, You've got to get that handler where he's going to do this. You've got to get the handler where he's going to do this. Now, back to our little lady with the giant schnauzer, 150 pounds soaking wet. She's not going to be able to physically do it. And there you're into a situation where your major ways of correcting the problem are eliminated by her physical uh, lack of physical strength. Then, yes, then you can step in and knock a lot of the rough edges off. But sooner or later, you're going to have to get that dog and that handler where she can at least get the dog into an obedience down, where he acts up, plots her down, and the dog goes, okay. Uh, so in dealing with handler-aggressive dogs, your biggest limitation is the handler. Will the handler do what you're asking him to do, which comes back to, the lady earlier this morning that says, what if they don't do what you want them to do? You, see, you show them the door and you write a, and you write a, a training record on it. Recom recommend euthanasia or what have you. If you can't get the owners of the dog to cooperate and institute effective corrections, there's nothing you can do. Take traits that require you to take, take the bull by the horns and get him under control. I don't see the advantage in it. And, and I, quite honestly, and I will defer to the crowd, uh, because I have not dealt and do not deal with puppies that much. My most, I'm mostly dealing with adult dogs. So those of you, I refer to you breeders, and there's different schools of thought on that. I personally don't like to see puppies you know, constantly rolled on their back as a matter of procedure. I, I think that does a lot of damage, can cause a lot of handler sensitivity, can create problems that wouldn't be there, can actually create aggression if it's not needed. Remember, that alpha roll is for these two situations only, period, end of story. You do not violate that. If you start benignly running around alpha rolling dogs for no reason, they don't know what they're getting their butt whooped for, and they will start getting irritated with it, and you will start enhancing aggressive behavior. Because after a while, you know, I'm tired of getting my butt whooped from nothing. I'm going to nail this guy. So, no, I would not, and I don't know, I'll, I'll defer to the breeders. Show of hands. <laughs> Those that deal with puppies, like I say, I don't deal with puppies. Yes, ma'am. I used to recommend the mom getting his deep book, and they, for every little interaction, would do the alcohol yeah. with the puppy. He became extremely aggressive, and I agreed for temperament after 30 years. And, and plus, he was turned off. He didn't want any people contact. Yeah, sure, he's getting his butt whipped all the time, and he doesn't know why. And they didn't know any better. They just didn't took it very well. Okay, anybody else have comments on it before I move on? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. A lot more successful in teaching the puppy a down. You know, pup, kinder, kindergarten puppy training, that kind of thing. I think that builds bond. But arbitrarily alpha rolling puppies for no damn reason whatsoever is ridiculous. No, I would not do that. Yes, ma'am. You are wasting your time. 
<laughs> you are wasting your time. If you're dealing with the general public, and, and I'm dealing with the general public too, they're called dog handlers. <laughs> if you're dealing with the general public and they are afraid of their dog, you're wasting your time. And we're going to get to rank in just a minute. Let me get into Let me finish alpha roll, and then we're going to get into to dominance, aggression, or, or rank drive. Okay, let me show you this tape. Let me tell you this story. The thing about dominance, aggression, and rank drive, or dominance, aggression, slash rank drive, depending, you know, they're both the same thing. A rank dog, a rank dog, a dog that is genetically high in rank, or has, has genetic rank drive, if not sufficiently led, will attempt to lead. Now, he is not comfortable in this situation. As a matter of fact, he's very insecure in this situation because, face it, it is a human world. But once you take that dog and you sufficiently dominate and show him who's boss on a regular and daily ba basis as a matter of practice, and I'm not telling you alpha roll every day by any stretch of the imagination, the dog becomes more relaxed. He accepts his position. He'll test it from time to time. Well, let me see if I can take the old man today. <laughs> nope, no, 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 not today. Okay. Uh, he becomes more relaxed, a more social individual, and can blend in to society. Such is the case of the tape I'm about to show you. This is canine Mark. Mark uh, came from a vendor, high rank. High rank. His original handler could control him. No problem. But. That handler quit, went to another station, what have you, and the people in that particular station decided to give Mark to another dog handler that had already been through one dog. And that handler was the meekest, mildest little guy you'd ever want to meet. Okay? And after a while, Mark took full advantage of him, and Mark hated him with a passion. Uh, he was coined the 45 degree heel because the guy's walking with the dog and Mark's at a 45 degree trying to get as far away from the as he can. <laughs> okay? If Mark wanted to rip all the luggage out of the bottom of a bus and chew on it, phew, who's going to stop him? <laughs> it ain't going to be this guy. So, here we had genetic rank, and here, remember what I said, genetic behavior, environmental conditioning. Here we have rank drive. And this handler had this dog for about a year. Okay? And so Mark goes, Wah! and the handler leaves him alone. That's environmentally conditioning and enhancing rank. So he gets stronger and stronger and tougher. And he says, I can take this guy anytime. Da 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 da. Finally, he gets to a point where he's recalled to the home office. And I get him. Okay? So let me play this tape. Now, we, it says, yep, of course, that we know the dog is going to be in muzzle. We know the dog will fire in a certain situation, so we will get the dog to fire. And you will see me do an alpha roll. Very long alpha roll. I started jogging after this. Okay? Now, you're going to see a lot of things. You're going to see me, because I tend to punctuate my alpha rolls with an occasional bite on the top of the head. I just feel if they feel teeth on them, that kind of, <laughs> you know. Most of the growling you're going to hear in this tape is not the dog. Okay? But watch the dog's tail, because what you're going to see is the dog will start to submit, I'll start laxing up, and I can't see it because the tail's coming out my, my butt in there. The tail will go, and then he'll fire again. And we're into round two and three and four. Okay? Let's watch it. There's Marky. Trying to get the dog to break the down because we knew that would cause him to fire.
Watch the tail. A strong little sucker. <laughs> Now watch the tail. See, the tail's still out. He's baiting me. He's being still until I relax, and he's going to go again. Now he's still cutting eyes up. Start to get off of him. He starts to get up on his own. Uh-uh. You don't get up till I tell you to get up. Got his feet up underneath him. I couldn't get him on his back. <laughs> Thank you, Clark. <laughs> Uh, right into the eyes. I'm showing all my teeth. I'm growling. I'm doing the whole bit. He'll go about two more rounds. <laughs> Try to get up on his own again. I'm driving home a point. What I'm effectively doing is taking away a year's worth of environmental conditioning in less than five minutes. He'll go about one or two more rounds. He keeps trying to get up in advance, and I'm driving a point home. You don't get up till I tell you. Light pressure. There's never any more than just the feel of my hand on his throat. <laughs> now it breaks the eyes. He's going into the fetal. He's not looking up at me anymore. Occasionally he'll look up and he'll give him a growl and he'll look away again. I'm just communicating totally with voice now. Now pivoting just on my head, keeping my face right over his, direct eye contact, growl now and then. Okay. Huh? That was Mark. Mark. The rest of the rest of the story of Mark. Mark, huh? Mark, the next day I placed Mark in Ricky Radas's class. Ricky's one of my instructors. He's about 250 pounds Samoan. <laughs> it's funny to watch. <laughs> Mark had so much drive, mostly hunt. He loved to hunt for dope. That any time something kept him from doing it, like an obedience command, he'd just fire. And it got to be kind of hilarious. Uh, put him with Ricky Rodas's class. Ricky put him with Lauren Bennett as a handler. Uh, and it was funny to sin because Ricky would be up there standing on a leash. And Mark would want to go, oh, I'm going to go into a search. I'm going to go into a search. And he'd reach over and he'd hit Ricky. And then he'd look up and go, oh, God. <laughs> and we went, you know, put him with a handler, a real <clears throat> handler that knew what he was doing. Mark is working in foul checkpoint. Catching, I don't know what his stats were last month, but Foul Furious is one of our hottest checkpoints. 
and he's totally fine. Had a dog in the last class, same thing. Dog named Rex. This is the guy, that, this is the dog that stole the handler's underwear in the hotel room, balled up on it, went <laughs> The handler's standing there naked. You know. <laughs> Alpha rolling. And some other methods that we'll talk about later. That dog is, loves that handler. And that's the difference. That's which everybody goes, oh, this is so hard on the dog. And no, 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 no. Dogs that are not, ranked dogs that aren't sufficiently led hate their handler. They're wimps. They're underlings to them. You give a, a ranked dog a handler that's going to enforce what he's saying, isn't going to put up with any trash, and the dog just respects the hell and loves him to death. You know? And it, it's totally the opposite of what you think. Now, I know there's a lot of mis misunderstanding about alpha roll, but how it is used here is effective at diminishing both handler and dog aggression. It is extremely effective. Yes? What do you consider to be severe dog fighting? In other words, you try and separate them in a Hunda Auslaufen? Oh, uh, would you, what, what would I consider to be severe dog fighting? In other words, remember what I said to do in a Hunda Auslaufen, two dogs are fighting. You put, bring them apart, you put them down, he doesn't go down, he keeps lunging back, or he fires at you. That's severe. Either way. Either way. Uh, what, you, what you want, you don't want to jump right to rank. If, like if a dog shows aggression at you, sometimes a dog will come out and you'll go, and I'll go, down. Huh? And so I'll go, okay, I'm sorry. I'm. But if he, I go down and he goes, I'm going to say, okay, down. <laughs> you know. went for other dogs? Yeah. And, and it isn't something that you need to do a lot of. I mean, no, just enough. Yes, ma'am. You know, I just wanted to talk about alternative methods because in a dog class, I don't think it's good for, for people to teach that in a dog class. Oh, I agree. In a basic dog yes, class. let me address that now. Okay, uh, you get a situation and you're going to see that this dog needs to be alpha roll. Okay, you're in a class environment. First of all, you're going to have to sit down with a handler and say, okay, this is what I'm going to have to do to address this problem, and eventually this is what you're going to have to do to address this problem. Are you willing to do this? Yes or no? If you're not willing to do it, see you. Um, because that's the only way you're going to be able to address this. Um, now, there are some other alternative measures I'll get into just a little bit. But you do not want to do this in a class environment simply because people will freak. I, mean, I, I see it happening all the day because invariably it's the instructor, right? You got a rookie handler out with this rank dog, and the dog comes up to me and goes, and jumps on me in muzzle. <laughs> Hello. <clears throat> and that handler was sitting there thinking his instructor's lost his mind, you know? No, you have to explain, hopefully in advance, what you're going to do, why you're going to do it, and then not do it in the presence of a class. Now, Eventually, you're probably going to wind up having to do it in the presence of a class. The dog's going to act up in the class. If that happens, if that happens, and you wind up having to address a problem with other students present, you go, time out, put your dogs up, we're going to have a little talk. What you just saw me do was for this and this and this only, I'm the one that will dictate if you don't you ever do this to any dog without me telling you to do it first. Does everybody understand that? Don't you ever, 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 because you will majorly screw a dog up. Does everybody understand that? Yes, teacher. Okay, go get your dogs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the, the only other thing you do is, like we said, is say, okay, we don't want you in this class right now, but I will meet with you after the class for the next couple of weeks and see if we can address it. But sooner or later, there's no way you're going to be able to do alpha rolls over here and then bring him back into the class, because sooner or later, you're going to wind up doing it in that classroom. Sooner or later, no way around it. Or letting him get away with murder, one, or the other, one way or the other. Because if the only other thing you can do is, because what you get into, say, okay, I, we're not going to alpha roll in the classroom, okay? People will get freaked out. So if the dog acts up uh, in the classroom, you just give him an obedience down. Cool. Handler goes in there, dog acts up, he goes down, dog goes. <clears throat> now what you going to do? <laughs> you can try thumping him, then the dog may fire, then he's getting away and you're undoing everything you've done thus far. Okay, as I said, a rank dog, if not sufficiently led, will attempt to lead. This is the steps we go to in addition to the alpha roll that you've just seen. 
to address dominance aggression. Okay, we acclimate the dog to a muzzle, first of all, right off the, right off the bat. The dog is ignored for the first one to three weeks. By, by ignored, and I think that may be what this lady is referring to, you separate the dog from the handler, you can do that. At least you, the only thing this dog gets is food and water. He is effectively removed from the pack environment of the household. He gets food and water, that's it. Now by separating him, Rank dogs are also very high, usually in pack. They like to be and dominate all everybody else. But you put him out and make him be a lone wolf for a while, he's a little more receptive to training. No free petting or free play. Okay? What that means is if the dog comes up and rubs up against you and goes, pet me, you go, it's on you. Down. He lays down, I'll pet you. He must do something for any attention. He gets nothing for free. The dog is gradually forced to sleep away from all bedrooms. Typically, if the dog has been housed in the house, rank dogs will typically take possession of bedrooms. This is because it's the core of the pack, or the core of the den, and the, the pack leaders sleep in the core of the den. The underlings sleep out where it's colder. So they will typically have possession of the bedroom at least and sometimes the bed. So you gradually get him acclimated to a crate and you move him out down the hallway into gradually over a period of days into a kitchen. Uh, dog is not allowed on furniture or beds. Typically rank dogs like to get on top of stuff. I am the king of this kingdom, everything below me, cool. All right, so you don't let him on furniture or beds. The owner is seen standing, I like this one. I personally love this one. The owner is seen standing or sitting in the dog's bed or favorite spot. We're making a nice clear statement there. So we've got a basket in the corner where this dog sleeps or something like that. He comes in from the yard one day and there's dad sitting there reading a the paper. You know, what do you want? Get out of my face. And the dog goes, mm, cool. Okay. No competitive play, mouthing, or jumping up. Now, Mouthing, that's a big thing that rank dogs do. Not to be confused with puppy play biting, okay? <laughs> Puppies like to put mouths on, that's part of dog, doggy dog etiquette. Oh, that's play bite, da, 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 da. that ain't rank. Don't go with this puppy. But a full grown rank dog, he'll mouth. You don't allow that. You say no. And they're, they're mouth and play. Here, play with me, play with me. Give an obedience command. Down. Okay. Usually down. Competitive play. Competitive play is tug of war. Tug of war with toys. Okay. You never do tug of war with a rank dog. Obedience work in muzzle initially, then you may progress to a head collar depending upon the level of aggression the dog is showing. But obedience. That's where you push a lot of obedience on rank because that is a level of control. I tell you what to do. Okay? Everybody got down to eight yet or you need a little time? Everybody down to eight? Okay. Nine. Owner takes possession of all toys while in the house or yard. The owner always ends play sessions by taking possession of the toy. My toy. I let you play with it when I want you to play with it, but it's my toy. Toys, food, and attention must be earned by performing obedience. Owner eats first. The family members eat first. Again, we're sending a real clear message. You are down here. I'm pack leader. I get the kill first. I eat first. Then when, I, when I'm done, you can eat. So you go in there. You put him in obedience down in the kitchen. The whole family comes in there and eats, and he has to stay in that down if he's above. It, you muzzle him, tie him to a refrigerator, it don't matter, but he sits there and watches the rest of the family eat. Then he eats. Have the dog and muzzle in situations that may result in aggression, and if aggression occurs, obedience down as an alternative, and if that doesn't work, progress to an alpha rule. But you go your down first, you don't jump alpha rule right away. In this case with Mark, we jumped alpha rule right away because we knew, well, no we didn't because I called for a down first. 
Dog broke. I said, off legging, which is Dutch for down. Dog went, Rrr! and I went into it. So you call for a down first. Because that usually, if he violates the down command, then you've got more than ample probable cause to go into, to use a law enforcement term, to go into alpha roll. Use a drag line to pull the dog off the furniture or out of the way. If, if you're letting the dog into the house out of muzzle and he gets up onto the bed or something, it's kind of touchy to reach up there and grab this sucker by the collar because then your hand's coming in right next, to the, right next to the business end. So you get a little drag line, which may, might be a four-foot lead, something like that. Let him drag it around the house. Then you can reach down here and say, get off the bed. Now, so you have your rank drive dog comes in, shows up at your class, or it's one of your puppies or what have you, you wind up having to address rank. What you have to do is you have to sit the family down and you have to say, okay, look, you've got two options. You either go this route, all right, and you talk to them about alpha roll, you show them this list, you say, you have to abide by these rules, the whole family has to abide by these rules, or you put this dog down. Unless, of course, you can find another owner that is real willing to play this game. <laughs> Good luck, but they, they are out there. But that is their choice. You either do this or forget it. You're, you're into having to put the dog down. That's your only option. Uh, only option. Now, if they say, I can't do it, or if in your own estimation you sit there and you look at the family and you've got like elderly in the house, little kids in the house, and the owner will not keep the dog out of the house in a kennel and just have a relationship that, of the dog outside the family, he won't play that game, then again, your only recommendation is euthanasia. It's the only thing you can do. Because the, the owner has to commit to totally restructuring this dog handler relationship. He's got to totally commit to it, and then he's got to maintain it. Yeah, if he goes for the first six weeks and goes through all this, and then he says, fix that problem, and he goes back to his old, old ways, that remember, drives can be enhanced or diminished, never created or eliminated. So that rank will surface. The dog will test him from time to time. If the owner doesn't meet that challenge on a regular basis and keep his thumb right down between that dog's eyes all the time, as far as psychologically, he's got a thumb right there all the time that dog will escalate. If you have a dog that has been gone through this and is social now and all coochie coo and easy and you need to place that dog with another owner, you're into doing it all over again. <laughs> because that new owner is going to have to prove to this dog that he can be let, that he's a sufficient leader. Okay? And that's your biggest, the only problem you've got with rank drive dogs ain't the dog. It's the owners. Will the owners do this? If they won't do this, you haven't got a choice. Your, your options are out. And the only thing you can recommend is euthanasia. Now remember what we talked about environmental conditions, what this lady referred to, you know, environmental aggression. What she's referring to, and I, I'll give you a case of a Doberman that I was called in on several years ago. Doberman was, was ranking. He was driving this family nuts. Okay? Uh, you know, he'd get on the bed, and <clears throat> take possession of a bed, take possession of a couch. They just let him have it, you know. So I got called in, and I acclimated the dog to a muzzle. And I went out there, did a little bit of obedience. The dog went, Wah! and I went, Wah! okay. He gave up like that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Got back, and I never had to look a problem with that dog again. All right, got back to talking to the owner. Now, they'd had this Doberman since he was a little puppy. And they used to think it was so cute because they'd come up there and they'd put his food bowl down and he'd go rah, 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 all over the food bowl. They'd reach down and he'd go rah, rah, and they'd back off. And, oh, nah, 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 yeah, that was cute. And then they'd get up on the bed and he'd go rah, and they thought it was cute. And so what you're dealing with there is environmental conditioning. Now, let me tell you about two gentlemen named Thorndike and Skinner. These are psychologists, all right? Now, they did work several years ago with pigeons, of all things. They put a pigeon in a box, and the, the only thing they were trying to do is figure out if, a, if you can train, can you train an animal and how you do it, all right? So they got the pigeon, they were trying to get him to peck on one side of the box and you get a food reward. Peck on one side of the box, you get a food reward, all right? And what they learned, psychologists being psychologists, they make things very 
make the obvious very flamboyant. They said, if an animal's actions change his environment favorably, it increases the chance he will repeat that action. The other thing they learned, conversely, if an animal's actions change his environment to the negative, disfavorably, it decreases the chance he will repeat that action. Well, oh boy, that was a revelation. What's that? Praise, praise and reward versus correction. Okay? So in our Doberman case, the animal's actions changed his behavior favorably because people left him alone. Increases the chance that he will repeat that behavior. All right? Now, he meets me, and his actions suddenly changed his environment very much to the negative because he found himself with four feet in the air and me in his throat. Immediately decreased the chance he would repeat that action with me. All right? Something else they learned, just as a side note, for an animal to associate a reward or correction with a corresponding action, be it positive or negative, that reward or correction must be administered within one half to one second of the action for the dog to make a good association of it. <laughs> one half to one second. Not a lot of time. Okay? We all know the obedience guys. They all seen. Sit, 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 Ivan, sit, Ivan, sit, Ivan. Just taught him to count to five. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> one, two, one, one sit, two sit, three sit, four sit. Here comes, I'm sitting. So, in dealing with remembering that philosophy that we just talked about, in dealing with aggression, all right, this is where environmental behavior, environmental conditioning can enhance, 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 enhance. But if you come in, and you take a little bit of rank, I mean a minuscule that was, could have been handled when the puppy was six weeks of old, and I'm not even talking an alpha role, I'm saying, knock that off, give me the food bowl. You know, could have been handled. But no, they enhanced, 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 and all I did is just strip all that environmental conditioning right down to where we had manageable drive. No big deal. As long as you sufficiently correct the dog, you don't have a problem. Okay? But the rank, but an alpha role does, in, very, in a very short period of time, address environmental aggression as well. Let's talk about another type of aggression, just for a minute, talking about environmental conditioning. Guard drive. Guard. Dogs going, blah, 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 blah. okay? All right, we all got our garbage to collectors, right? We come down, collecting the garbage. Okay, so here we've got guard drive dog. Maybe he's got just a little bit of guard as a puppy. He comes out and goes, rat, 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 rat. Guy picks up, eh, screw you, throws the garbage can. But what does he do after that? He leaves. <laughs> okay, and this happens every once or twice a week for the dog's life. So by the time the dog is about two or three, he's a killer. <laughs> you forgot the mailman, and the UPS. mailman, UPS, all these guys. Okay, <laughs> every one of them, they do their thing and they go away. So what you need to do if you're talking to these people is say, look, my puppy gives up there and goes. Rah, 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 rah. Stop and pet him. Or just stop and talk to him. Don't go, don't leave. Just take a couple minutes. Would you mind here? Here's a couple bucks, so I don't care. Just talk to him for a minute. All right? And, and that will address it. And that's what we're telling uh, people. Uh, and we go, you know, like mailmen, UPS, you people that are in the dog communities, in your community, try and get to these guys. Okay? Because it's to their own best interest. If you offer to come in, look, we'll come in and give you a little class on aggression, how to avoid getting bit. You know, post office will jump on that with both feet, okay? So you go in and tell them, just don't walk away. You know, if the dog's on one side of the fence and you're on the other side of the fence and the dog's barking at you, stop and say, hey, what's happening, Joe? <laughs> you know, and the dog's right, right. Oh, hi, you're the mailman. How you doing? Okay, yeah. and then leave. Then you're not getting the environmentally conditioned aggression being enhanced on a daily basis by these outsiders, okay? All righty. So that's rank, and dealing with rank. Any other, let, let's, let's open it up for just a little bit on some other problems before I get into dog aggression. I'm going to address dog aggression coming up next. Dogs in a car. Huh? Dogs in a car. Dogs in a car. Oh, don't you love them? <laughs> yeah, uh, a lot of that is handled. Is, are you in the vehicle? In the vehicle. You, are you in the vehicle, the owner in the vehicle? 
Okay. Well, what we're mostly dealing with there, let's have a little quiz. What drive are we dealing with? GAR. Most likely. Okay. Uh, a lot of that can be administered by the handler or owner instituting an obedience command on the dog if he's in the vehicle. Down! Because the nice thing about the down, dogs don't generally like to get aggressive in a down position. <laughs> it's kind of hard. You know, they're trying to lay down and go, blah, blah, blah. you know, it doesn't sell real well. So you call a down position or you enforce a down. If you're not there, that's touchy. That's touchy. And the reason is because for, remember what I said, what Thorndike and Skinner came up with, is that for the dog to associate the correction with the action, he has to be corrected within one half to one second. All right? Say a dirty word here in a minute. Electricity. Power collar. In the hands of somebody that knows how to use one is a very effective tool because a power collar gives you a remote capability. And that's, that's what's lacking there. You're out of the picture. You're gone somewhere. Someone comes up to the car and the dog's going, blah, 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 blah. What is going to be your method of enforcement? You don't have one. If you have instituted the use of someone that knows how to use electricity effectively, and I will state that over and over, because electricity in the hands of somebody that knows how to use it is the best tool in the world for addressing a lot of problems. Or no bark. In, in bark is the same thing, no yeah. No, no bark collar. In the hands of somebody that doesn't know how to use it, you can screw a dog up in a New York second. But there, in that situation, handler is absent. You have to have remote capability to correct the dog. The only thing that will give it to you is electricity. Down is submissive. That's total submission. And, so, and the last thing about it also is you get the dog, especially taking, talking people aggression, the dog is that much further away from you, from that position. With a sit, he can still cheap shot. Take it from an old patrol dog. <laughs> Patrol dog agitator, and they can cheap shot you from a sit. From a down, they've got to come all the way up onto their feet. Yeah. But primarily, psychologically, it's more of a submissive position. Uh, the use of power. Now, I know this is not a real popular subject, <laughs> the use of electricity. And the reason it's not real popular, you usually get one of two extremes. Either you have somebody that says, oh my, cruel and unusual, oh my, yeah, I'm going to turn you into PETA and everything else. Or you have the other reaction, I'm going to use it for every damn thing. This is cool, plus button dog, just like my kid's car. <laughs> you know. It's one of the two extremes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mostly the guys that want to use it for everything have been to Tritronic seminars. Yes. Power collar seminars. There, yeah, the new, new collar, it's got to you know, reach three, 300 miles, you can electrocute a dog from Japan. <laughs> Buy this, $500. Okay. And the people that are on the other end of the spectrum just don't understand. I'm middle of the ground. Electricity, where you want to use electricity, is in a situation where all other methods have failed or you have to have a remote capability, as with the case of the lady from Taos. You've got to have a remote capability. The only way you can do that is electricity. All other methods have failed. Pinch collars. Let's talk about pinch collars for just a minute. All right. What is more humane? To sit there and rack on a dog for weeks with a pinch collar to his neck is so sore you can't touch it or give him one and only have marginal success or give him one good electrical shock and the pain is gone it, it, the second after it happens. What's more humane? I hardly ever, and you see the type of dogs I work, I hardly ever use a pinch collar. I can't think, since I've been with the Border Patrol, I can't think of one dog I have used a pinch collar on. I will use halties, I will use chain collars, and then if I get them, bad out. I have to institute hard corrections on, I will use electricity, because I feel electricity, in moderation, is a hell of a lot better than racking the hell out of a dog's neck for two weeks. Yes? Why would you use a slip collar before a pinch collar? Why would I use it like a choke chain? Yeah. Because I don't use pinch collars. I just don't like them. I, I mean, a slip collar can be less effective than a pinch collar. Sure could. And put more pressure on their feet, yeah. Um, I would if I could understand it. Okay, why would I use... Now, a slip collar, is, what you're referring to as a choke chain? Right. Okay. Choke chains give a brief choking correction. Pinch collars pinch skin, and that abrases skin. Over long periods of time, that gets painful. 
Now, I'm not saying totally abandon, to go home and throw all your pinch collars away. There's always, we've got pinch collars there. We may use them from time to time. In my experience, I have rarely run across a situation where I would rack on a dog with a pinch collar for two weeks. Eh. If I'm having to do that, I'm going to electricity and get it over with fast and get better results. Yes? I wouldn't, no, it depends who's using it, how and why. Every day. I, I don't know if you could go, stretch the point that it will make him more aggressive. I'm not going to say that. I think it depends who's using it, how they're using it, do they know how to use it, and what corrections, are they, where are they correcting the dog with it for? Um, yes, it could. Uh, you know, misused electricity will make a dog more aggressive. Misused a choke chain will make a dog more aggressive. But uh, we just, the use of electricity has its place. It's a very specified, it is a tool. It is not a silver bullet. Neither is an alpha roll. It's not a silver bullet. It has its place, its tool, is a tool to be used in this, these type of cases. It's not a pyorrhea either. Yeah? Most of the people that come to classes though don't have a situation or opportunity. Speak up. <laughs> Most of the people that come through obedience classes aren't in a position to be using electricity. Oh, I agree. So they're given either a pinch or a slip. And a lot of people don't use slip collars correctly, and I yep. think there's more damage done with that than a pinch collar. Well, it's all in the, in the hands of the instructor and trying to teach the people to do it. You also have this option. This is a lot easier for somebody to use than a pinch collar. A lot easier. And typically what we're using the pinch collar for is dogs that are dragging people, you know. And they say, put a pinch collar on that monster. This will address when what we're talking about is draft, by the way. That's on your, that's on your hand, handout sheet. Okay. Down way at the bottom, it's a man-made drive called draft. Drive to, be, to pull when restricted by harness or line. Okay. That's, you see it in the northern breeds. You see it in the herding breeds. Draft drive. In other words, you throw a tight line on a dog, he's going to pull you, okay? And that's what typically you see them, and I've been to obedience classes where a dog with high draft, they're throwing him in a pinch. And all that's doing is causing the dog to be a little more dis uncomfortable pulling, but he'll still pull because you're engaging a drive because he's got a tight neck. You've got a tight line, pull. Engage a drive. This does not involve a tight, restricted line. This, if he pulls with this, he don't go nowhere. <laughs> Inner dog aggression. Okay, we're going to go through each of these individually. First thing we're going to do is we're going to identify what's causing it. Because your drives that you're talking about, that we were talking about with human aggression, also exist with inner dog aggression. You bring home a new dog, and upon entering the yard with him, your existing dog attacks him. What do I have? Guard. Guard, okay? Here's the protocol for bringing home a new dog. The handler, the owner of this dog created this problem because he brought a strange animal into this existing animal's territory and expected everything to go like Lassie and they just love each other, okay? Here's how you do this. First of all, being upon the situation or the level of aggression in the dogs, acclimate both dogs to muzzle. Keep the dogs apart. Keep them hopefully in opposite ends of the house or don't bring the new dog home yet. Acclimate both dogs to muzzle. Then you have one family member, maybe wife and husband. Husband goes and gets new dog, puts him in a muzzle. Wife goes and gets old dog, puts him in a muzzle. And they have a prearranged meeting spot, park in the neighborhood. Because what we have done there, guard is a territorial behavior. Therefore, you take the dog to neutral ground to introduce them neutral ground okay so we come up there and we go nose to nose on leash introductions and muzzle you correct with obedience downs or what have you for any aggression let them sm sniff take them for a walk let the old dog lead in the walk existing dog leads if you happen to have either if you have enough control of the dogs and you're comfortable enough with them or you have a secure facility like maybe a softball field with chain link around it do hunde auslaufen in neutral ground. Then leash them up, start back. Again, existing dog leads. 
Watch for aggression as you're approaching the property boundaries. Not your properties, but the dog's property boundaries, backyard. Before you bring those dogs in, turn them off, turn them off leash together, still in muzzle. You pick up any articles of competition, toys, food bowls, food, anything like that. You pick those up so they're not in the picture. And then you're into Hundauslaufen in the backyard or in the house, still in muzzle. Continue in muzzle until you, as the owner, are reasonably comfortable taking them out. But make it a while. Don't do it the next day. Young puppy needs to be in muzzle? No. I'm saying depending, depending upon, you know, large adult dogs. Okay? But if you, if you bring a young puppy in with a large adult dog, that buddy better be in right. muzzle. Okay. <laughs> now, I have a certain fear that, and what I recommend to my handlers, never do I have my handlers leave two dogs together without somebody being there. Mm -mm. Now, I know everybody does it to one degree or another. The problem that you have, and we were talking about a lot over lunch, if, if anything will decide to fire a dog off, you'll be surprised. For example, a bird dies and falls into the yard. And we get in a discussion over whose bird this is. Once that fight starts, then you're going to come home to carnage. I mean, you're going to have some severe vet bills, and in some cases, people have come home and found their dogs shredded, especially if you've got packs of dogs running together. If you have more than one dog, more than just two dogs, you've got three, four dogs running together, and you're not at home, that you're running a risk. Because once one dog gets down and starts getting his butt kicked, the other three go, cool, and everybody jumps on it, and pretty soon it turns into, you come home and you think, you know, Charles Manson paid you a visit. I got a dead dog written across the refrigerator. Kill the dog <laughs> in blood. You know, I mean, it's, it can be that bad, especially if you have more than two dogs running together unsupervised. Because now, other things that can happen that you wouldn't think would happen: a seizure, epileptic seizure. These can come on. You'll have no warning, especially as your dogs get up. Maybe they, one of them suddenly starts suffering from epilepsy. You never even know it's there. You're at work. That dog goes into a seizure. The other dog goes, he's suffering, kill it. <laughs> okay? Things can happen. Now, that's just my own phobia. And I know every owner of dogs has to make a decision. But now you're going to make a conscious decision. Are you going to take the risk of that happening, yes or no? And you know your dogs. I don't. But you are. Acknowledge this when you leave here. You are taking a risk, running dogs together without somebody being there. You're taking a tactical risk. But now, hopefully, it's an educated one. Okay. Your dog is perfectly social with another dog until that dog approaches you, then your dog attacks him. What do we have? Protection. Protection. Okay. What happens here? Hundauslaufen in muzzle. You've got to have two people. Okay. Got to have two people because once you're going to institute a correction here, you need to get this dog that was, you know, out of the picture. Because once you go, and start doing any type of correction, this dog going, yeah, I'll teach you to beat on me, and he'll dive in there a couple of, couple of shots. Okay? See, daddy's kicking your butt, and I'm going to help. <laughs> okay? So you've got to have two people to get these dogs, you know, get, get the non-offending dog out of the picture. Uh, try and stay very neutral. Uh, take neutral ground. Don't, you know, if your dog's up really hugging to you and stuff, just walk away from him. Go over, pet the other dog, try and stay pretty much neutral ground between them. And if your dog acts up, institute effective corrections. Two dogs of the same sex in the same household fight whenever the opportunity presents itself. Who we, what do we got? Rank. This is one situation, if we're talking about males, this is one situation in which neutering may help. May. May help. Uh, if, they're both neutered already. if they're both neutered already, forget it. But if you've got two <laughs> intact males and they're fighting all over the place, then neutering may help. But you only neuter one, and which one do you think you neuter? The most dominant or the least dominant? The least. least dominant. Very, very good, because you neuter the most dominant. That takes him down a couple of noxes, and now the, the lower guy says, I can buy him now. He don't even smell like a man anymore. Okay. 
So you neuter the least dominant. Now, if you're dealing a, a nose to nose, trying to figure out which one's more dominant or least dominant, you can go to the vet and obtain injections of anti male hormones and try each dog individually over a period of months and then you and figure out which one would be the best one to neuter. If you neuter both, then we're back to everything being equal and we're all going to go back to fighting again. Uh, then Hunda Auslaufen, uh, again having more than one person there, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in this case, and in a lot of cases when I say Hunda Auslaufen, you're going to encounter those dogs that even Hunda Auslaufen won't work. You take them out there, yeah, boxing time, cool. You know, the rugby dogs. <laughs> they love going to Hunda Auslaufen and we get to get in four or five bar fights with other dogs. So those dogs, this isn't going to work. You know, after a certain point, you're just going to say, this ain't working. And then your only option to address the problem is just keep that dog separate from other dogs. It's the only thing you can do. Okay. Your dog exhibits signs of mental stress when approached by a strange dog, strange dog and suddenly attacks him. Survival. Two things will cause this. Either the puppy was removed from the litter at too young an age, usually before six weeks, puppy mill dogs or, or well, so now it's puppy mill or dogs that came out of uh, pet shops, things like that are notorious for this because they never learned dog to dog etiquette. So now they're afraid of all other dogs. Or the dog has had a real traumatic experience in the past, maybe he's been attacked by another dog, something like that. Now this is one case where you do not correct the dog for aggression. He thinks he's about to die, he's going to defend himself. If you correct, you will make the aggression worse. So what you got to do is you put him on a little long line, some of you may use those flexi leads, what have you, and use a head collar. And if it's real bad, you may want to use a muzzle, but head collar will usually be sufficient. And then what you got to do is get with a training club or somewhere and pick out dogs in order of their perceived threat to your dog. And this might be size or temperament, got to take both into consideration. You can have a men pin that he thinks he's, you know, Cujo. But uh, you pick out dogs, they're pretty placid dogs, and introduce them online. Now, your dog, if he's in survival, is going to be, oh my God, another dog, you know, back here. And the same thing goes for fear of people or strangers. Oh my God. Now what humans have a real tendency to do, it's reach down and comfort. Right? Dogs don't know what comfort mean. Comfort mean praise. I'm getting praise for, for peeing all over myself behind my handler's leg. Okay? So the important thing there is the handler stays totally neutral. Oh, you're a wimp, aren't you? You know, <laughs> you know he don't say beans to the dog. He don't say voice tone. He don't say nothing. He's... And as soon as that dog finally gets up the guts, comes around and starts out, then you kick in the praise. Good boy. He runs back here. So you get him out there, and if he goes, eh, you just turn him with a head collar. Come on, well, that, was, that was dumb, and walk away. And then you can progress up from that to a muzzled Hunda Auslaufen, if the dog's large enough to accommodate a muzzle. Muzzled Hunda Auslaufen, and just let the dog be over here. If you turn him loose like in, a, in a, a fenced area, it should be a secure area. You turn him loose, and the dogs are running around, and here we got four dogs over here just having a wonderful time together. And there's your dog sitting over there going, there are dogs over there. Don't you go over there with him. You stay over here with the other four. Hey, guys, what's happening? Hey, what's wrong with that wimp? You want to come over here and play? And after a while, they'll start coming over. Don't push it. The whole thing is don't try and drive the dog into it and never correct for aggression if it's survival. Your dog chases and kills a small chihuahua. What do we got? Prey. It ain't dog aggression. It's little and it's running. Let's kill it. Uh, obedience, formal obedience around other small dogs and generally small animals. Uh, the thing that you run into, again, is what's firing the drive. So while your dog may be able to walk into an obedience ring and do figure eights around chihuahuas, the second he's offline and one of them runs, he's toast. <laughs> okay? So there's only so much you can marginally do to correct this problem. Only so much. And it, it, it all hinges on obedience and control. Uh, your dog wants to fight with every dog everywhere, regardless of the situation.
Multiple choice question. <laughs> Fight. Fight. These are your truly dog aggressive dogs. Now, just like rank and everything else we've talked about, how much is environmental conditioning, how much is genetic? If you have a dog that is high fight for other dogs, genetically, pfft, forget it. I've seen them where they enjoy alpha roll. This is full, and, I, and I've got a picture, I should have, I got a video, I got one right now, and I should have brought, I was trying to deal with uh, gunfire aggression. And I had this dog on a full flip, and I'm in there spitting and frothing, and that dog's tail's just going. <laughs> because he's got fight. Oh, cool, I get to engage this drive now. <laughs> If they're genetically high in fight, you ain't going to be able to do it. The only thing you'll be able to do is avoid the situation and kennel separately. If it is environmentally based, then Hunda Ausloff and starting out online in muzzle introductions, they fight, you pull them apart correct, kicking them off leash and muzzle, they get into a fight, you separate them, then you can be begin to diminish that down. Yes? No. Who am I alpha rolling? Who am I alpha rolling? The severe one. The one, because remember, what's the first step? You pull the dog apart, put them in a down, facing away from each other. Now, the, the guy that ain't going into a down, and the guy that's punching me in the face with the muzzle and trying to get back here, that's the one I'm nailing. And if you, you'll have a dog come up in Hunda Auslofen and, and jump him, okay? And this dog's going, oh, and about then the handler dives in. Of course I don't alpha roll the poor dog that didn't do anything. <laughs> you know? I just say, come here, Fluffy. Let's just go over here while we kick this boy's butt. That's a good boy. All right. Only aggression. And you only alpha roll on severe aggression. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Neck. Collars. Good point. When, she asks, when I'm initially separating her, separating by the tails. I don't know where the wives' tail came from. When two dogs get into a fight, grab their tails and pull. Number one, you're going to be, what did I say about taking dogs off of bites? If your dog bites somebody, if you pull away, you're pulling out muscle now. You're going to be doing that, number one. Number two, about the time he lets go of that dog, he is going to nail it out of you. All right? No, in a dog fight situation, if they have collars, let me preface it. If they have collars in a dogfight situation, you go to collars and try and choke them off. And you've got to have two people to do it. Go into collar. Go to the collar. The head is what you want to control. Because once you get him off that bite, and we referred to it le earlier with people getting involved and trying to bust up dogfights, they get bit. All right? In some cases, generally speaking, it is not frustration involved with it. It's rank. He just didn't know who the he had in front of him. So the most important thing that you want to control in a dog fight is the head. That's what teeth are. So you come in here, you get a hold of that, you cock up, get the dog off the bite that he has, and you control the head. Set him down and get him turned. Yes. And if there's not, you know, and I've been in a lot of bad situations. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> uh, you know, I've picked dogs up and thrown them over fences and you know what. If, you got, if you're there by yourself, it is a major losing battle. The only thing you can hope to do is try and not get in between them. Yeah. People letting their dogs run off leash, the dog will run up and he goes into the male posturing and growling and like that business and he does not want to walk away and I don't blame him because he knows what this other dog is going to do. The problem comes when, I mean, I've got to get moving. I give him a tug and he snarls. What, 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 what do I do? I mean, I don't even know what this is. He snarls, he snarls at you? No. Oh, no. oh, at the other dog? Well, I don't blame him. Yeah, he's saying. Yeah. 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 I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over it as long as he's not firing on you. Okay. I wouldn't lose, you're, you're doing your best you can. You got to remember, Dogs are dogs. I mean, we can't expect them to benignly accept children jumping on their backs and come blindsided. And I was talking to the same lady at the break where she's going through the store with her service dog and kids run up and go around the dog's neck. Well, I mean, 
Dogs are dogs, folks. <laughs> they're going to protect themselves. They've got certain unalienable rights of dogdom, and one of them is they don't have to put up with a six-year-old blindsiding them out of the blue and just totally accept it, especially when they don't even know it's a six-year-old. For all they know, it's a Doberman Pinscher in the first half second this kid's on him. One thing I, I recommend people sometimes carry if they've got a big problem with that is those loud-ass boat horns. Those boat horns, they're compressed air can boat horn. All right? You, you see the high school kids do it, you blowing them in football games. All right. Now you get some coming out of the blue, coming up to your dog, you and that'll, that'll send most dogs going scattering here and there because they don't know what it is. It startles them. Huh? Oh, it'll borrow your dog, but it's better than having him chewed up. But especially if your dog's here, the dog's coming in over here, you pull him back and you... Yeah. Oh, yeah, that works great. No, I wouldn't worry about it. He's, he's just, dogs are dogs. He's saying... Who you? I'm going with her. Have you gotten through all your points? Uh, yeah, I just got one more point because the folks that want to leave. Uh, and I'll stay and answer other questions. Um, there is one book, and I did a lot of, and one, one of the reasons why I decided to come out and start doing these lectures is when I, I was reading through all the books that you can buy, I had a lot of folks writing books, and they don't really address aggression. And sometimes, I, I've seen a couple of books where they go, dog aggression, and you get about a paragraph. <laughs> you know? But in, in, in looking around, I did find one book, and I have it up here somewhere. Yeah. This is Do Dogs Need Shrinks by Peter Neville, subtitled uh, What to Do When Man's Best Friend Misbehaves. It's still on books, you know, in bookstores now. Uh, he goes into quite a bit about aggression. Most of the stuff on Rank Drive that I, I referred to came from this book. However, you will see him not recommend Alpha Rule. All right? And that's just a difference of opinion. If you're dealing with a hardcore, tough, aggressive, rank dog, Alpha Rule does work. And you have to remember, he's writing a book. All right? Now, how does he describe an Alpha Rule and the proper method of doing it in a book? You know? So he doesn't, he doesn't recommend that, but he's very good on both aggression and about a myriad of other little problems that you have, including chewing, digging, barking, whatever. Very good book to have in your library. Okay, to uh, end up, and I'm going to, for those of you that want to stay, I have one more case that I'm going to show you. All right, I know there's folks that need to leave. Uh, I hope that I've been able to get across and give you a little bit of insight what causes aggression and thereby what you can do to address aggression that not every dog just because he bites needs to be destroyed that's the biggest point just because a dog bites does not mean you have to destroy it uh, if you apply what, what little I've been able to give you in the last four or five hours I think you'll find that the majority of it works if you remember when to use alpha roll, when to use the corrections I've spoken about, you should have some success. Uh, hope you've enjoyed it. And for those that want to stay, I'm going to go over one more case before we break. Okay? All right. Thank you. So in closing, one of the things I want to point out to people that are new to Liberty.com is our website is so big that when we put new things into the website, it, it kind of disappears into the abyss. And if you're new to Liberty.com, you may not realize that there's over a thousand videos that we've put together over the last 35 years. The vast majority of them are free. I recommend 
you go there, use a the search function, find the videos that interest you, and see the quality of work that we have to offer for free.